last session of the day. We've made it. Yes, um, we have behind the enrollment curtain, and we have um, Lisa Corbin, we have um, Bryce Bickle, and David Slayball that will be presenting. And they'll be talking to us a little bit about the importance of the enrollment process, give us some statistics, and to tell us how we can make use of a dashboard that will help us um, in real time. So we look forward to hearing from um, their presentation. So thank you. Come on. All right. So I guess we got the end of the end of the day here. So. <laughs> So try and try and bear with me. Lisa's got the exciting information, so um, so we'll leave her either for uh, I think we'll leave her for last. And David is on his way. So um, so thanks for uh, first of all for um, guiding our students through life. Um, you know, uh, faculty have a huge impact on uh, student development and uh, and life trajectory. Um, I know so many faculty in my life did. So thank you for. Uh, your commitment to students. So, um, so I'm going to kind of go through online. Uh, what we used to call AGS has obviously been through a lot of changes. Um, and so I'm going to let Lisa share from dashboard standpoint kind of the data that she's been mining and working on, which is wonderful. Um, but I'm going to share from the online side kind of what we're doing um, currently to reach the online student in the online market. So. Um, as of a couple of years ago, you all know that we were at multiple locations and sites across the state, and so we did a lot of um, networking and grassroots and a lot of physical interaction with students, um, and that has obviously changed drastically. So um, it's pretty rare that we see a student face-to-face. -face. We have some that will, you know, they're local that will come in, um, but all of our students now are at a distance. So uh, communication happens through email, text, phone, uh, Zoom meetings. Um, and so our, really our market has changed um, from what it was even, even two years ago. So I'm gonna quickly go through uh, just the marketing and advertising um, uh, that we do. And if you have any questions, just feel free and stop me. So uh, there's really kind of five main areas that we work on and monitor and try and uh, put out to the market. Um, and I'll kind of hit on each of these areas, market awareness, networking and travel, uh, advertising, SEO and social media, um, and then outcomes and success stories. So market awareness really is kind of the first piece. Um, and many of you know Ed Welch, he, he's our director of communications. And so he does um, a lot as far as the news releases and media outlets and getting the word out. So he a lot of times we'll write the scripts and get some of that information out, um, whether it's uh, LinkedIn, um, to CEO Greenville, other organizations, uh, other media outlets. Um, and then we also have you know, videos that we put on YouTube. And then of course our main driver, which is uh, Southern Western, our website, um, suida.edu. Um, we also use email distribution lists across the state uh, and organizations. Um, and then internal, internally, we, we use Facebook as well uh, for market awareness. Um, we still do uh, as much networking and travel as we can. Um, we have an individual, uh, his name is Dean Greil, and he's our director of uh, engagement and networking, uh, I believe is his title. Um, and so he basically travels all across the state. He goes to technical schools, he goes to uh, school districts, hospitals, uh, college fairs, all of that. Um, and so he really works on kind of all the relationships uh, across the state. Um, myself and my team, we also do some of that here in the upstate. And so we will uh, visit hospitals and tech schools and do all that here uh, in the upstate. But he handles most of the rest of the states, uh, also in North Carolina and then also in, in Georgia. So. Um, so one of the biggest areas now that we've moved fully online is our paid advertising. So um, this area has become really crucial for us because, you know, to, to reach the online market, um, you know, this market is very different than it was, you know, when we were offering hybrid or on-site courses. So um, it really takes multiple touches in multiple different areas uh, to impact a student as they're kind of in the process of making that decision. Um, 
So paid advertising really has the goal uh, to build brand and drive students to landing pages. Um, and we do that with kind of four, four main areas, uh, digital media, social media, radio, and publications. Um, so those are kind of the four main areas uh, that Crawford Strategies, who is our partner, um, that they, they are responsible for driving. Um, in our digital media, uh, some of the areas that, um, that are covered there are uh, native display, programmatic digital display, Google AdWords, uh, YouTube TV, uh, TrueView, connected TV, video pre-roll, uh, geofencing, uh, and then targeted emails. So that covers the majority of the budget and the majority of uh, the outreach that happens across really the southeast. So um, this kind of gives basically uh, an overlook of the entire year as far as the campaigns that they run and the timing. So you basically have three campaigns that happen each year. Um, so it's probably, it's probably a little hard to see, but um, basically you have a campaign that runs in the summer, a campaign that runs in the fall, um, and then also a campaign that runs in the spring. And so those all kind of drive uh, to each of our, our three SERP terms. Um, and then this slide uh, covers basically the top uh, five media spins. Um, number one is Google AdWords. Number two is uh, native. Number three is pro programmatic display. Four is Pandora. And then five is local radio. Um, so as you know, when you go, you know, if you go into Google and you type in, um, you know, something like Christian MBA, um, they have selected a, a multiple, uh, a number of different criteria that tag that student and, um, and they will have ads that pop up, you know, based on, uh, the criteria and the de demographic that we're, that we're looking for. Um, so this slide is basically kind of shows as far as the brand awareness on the left hand side, uh, these areas really focus more on brand awareness and less call to action. Um, and then on the right hand side, this is really conversion driven. So, uh, obviously radio, video and, and native are, uh, basically all branding. So it's really trying to uh, get SWU out in the market and build the brand. Um, and then everything as far as conversion, uh, display, you may see them, you know, Facebook ads, um, uh, social media, uh, and then search, of course, AdWords is, is also uh, uh, focused more on conversion. Um, so SEO is kind of one of the big big drivers at this point that um, you really have to have uh, a good search engine optimization uh, now because you have students that are, um, they're searching for you online and uh, it's really important to know kind of what the trends are, where they're clicking, where they're going and all of that. Um, and so we have, uh, we've partnered with Bright Edge uh, which has been a good, uh, a good partner for us. Um, and I think the contract ends this fall. Um, so we're in the process of reevaluating as far as whether we're going to continue with Bright Edge or not, but they've been helpful to us to help determine, um, uh, some of the SEO, where we're doing well, where we can improve, uh, and looking at some of that. Um, and then social media, uh, many of you know Jared Trudell, he does a great job with, uh, with all of our social media. Um, and so we're really trying to increase uh, uh, our brand and social media and push out as much as we can, both in Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and also YouTube. Um, we really want to create more videos that we, if we can. Um, it's right now we have video interns that will are basically creating the videos. So those are somewhat limited, um, but we know that that's an area that 
we want to continue improving on and, and getting more videos uh, out to the market. Um, and lastly, outcomes and success stories. So this is really um, an area where I think that we can use uh, your help. Um, this is something that we ask for quite often, but also uh, it's hard for us to know or gather or hear some of those outcomes and some of the success stories. Uh, but this is gonna be really important uh, for both Crawford and kind of our internal uh, social media uh, to communicate um, you know, what students are you know, experiencing after they graduate, um, what some of those success stories are, uh, both for online and for on-site. Uh, and so that's becoming uh, a really critical tool uh, nowadays uh, because there's so many messages and so many mixed messages that are out in the market. So, um, so success stories are really kind of uh, becoming a, a strong tool uh, that communicate value uh, for students as they're, as they're looking into um, higher education. Uh, and then, of course, special thanks to eCampus. Um, so I wanted to leave, of course, time for David and Lisa, um, but also want to open it up are, are there any questions that you have for me or anything that I can answer for you related to Crawford or online? Yep. A few of the terms that are less familiar to me. Um, can you go back to the data Sure. Uh, let's see. True View. You do True View? Yeah, so True View is basically. Um, YouTube um, and it is uh, Trueview is a live streaming service, so it's ads that basically come up on the front of an ad or a, a front of a video. Um, I think we have both five second and then fifteen second slots, um, and then some of this like YouTube Trueview is specifically YouTube, and then connected TV that could be Hulu, Netflix. Well, not Netflix; they uh, are ad free. Um, Hulu. Uh, Amazon Prime, uh, YouTube videos, and so what Crawford does is they buy with other providers lots and lots of slots. They can get them at a basically a decreased price, and then they will, if the individual meets our demographics, so they may be in the southeast, they may be, you know, have their bachelor's degree, and we may be targeting, you know, MBA, um, and so they may have a job in business, and so if they fit that demographic, and they have either clicked on our ad and they're going to view, it, it may be that an ad pops up. Um, same thing with Pandora. Um, Pandora is not listed, but sometimes you'll see videos if you have Pandora up, uh, you'll have videos that pop up on like Pandora. Um, native, I don't know if folks are familiar uh, with like nat native, which is essentially content marketing. Um, so it may be that, uh, uh, an education student is on, you know, reading about instructional design or, or something like that. Um, we may put, well, Crawford will put an article that they may be interested in that's related to, it's not selling, but it's an article on why you should seek an e-learning degree or instructional design degree or how it would benefit you. And so they'll click, click on that link and it may take them to Tyler Watts's article about why e-learning and why the importance of e-learning and then of course it will have Southern Western University um, but native is not a direct sell it's not saying Southern Western University apply now start dates it's really more content um, that's geared uh, for folks that are searching it's more brand awareness so so geofencing is um, if we have if you wanted to lock down a hospital uh, not lockdown it's a bedroom. Um, <laughs> if you want, if you had, you know, you had a, a big nursing nursing event at a hospital, you can actually uh, geotarget that, and then just send ads to all the phones and all the IP addresses in that area. So you could just put all of our ads out and geofence a technical school or a hospital. We don't do that very often. We have done it some, um, but you also. It's costly because you're also hitting a lot of people that don't meet your demographic. Um, just like other things, if you do, you know, um, TV or billboards, those types of things are hard hard to measure, and you're spending a lot on folks that may not fit into your demographic. So, um, 
social media is mainly used for retargeting. Uh, Crawford, uh, they will do some display, but it's focused more on folks that have, you know, kind of raised their hand. Um, if they've gone and clicked on our ad or if they've gone to our website, we do a lot of retargeting through social media. Um, and so, you know, track that very closely. If someone has, you know, clicked on an ad or expressed interest, we'll continue to retarget them, uh, put display ads out there uh, for them. They may see video, uh, see some video, um, and then they'll also track those conversions to see if that message is working or if it's not, um, and then uh, react to that. So, good questions. Any? There's there's a lot there's a lot of options. Um, you know, I think we have some really unique pieces uh, like community uh, and faith. Although faith and Christianity is is quite noisy actually in the marketplace. So. Um, I think that there's some opportunity to really define what, what still makes us really unique um, because there is a lot of Christian providers out there that are online as well. Um, so there are a lot of things that we do really well, um, like community and quality uh, and uh, you know, small class sizes, intentionality. Um, and uh, so yes, I think we stack up well it's hard to get that message with, you know, limited, I don't want to say limited budget, but it takes a lot of work to get that message for someone to make that decision. And there's a lot of noise and a lot of options. Um, and so students are more than ever now are doing all their research before they come to us. So quite often they say that over 50% students are making their decision before they even reach out to us. So at that point, they have applied, they have moved forward, and people trust that you can get all the information you need online before you make a decision. Um, and so that's where the SEO uh, and, and website design and all that becomes very critical because a lot of times they're making that decision before, uh, before they inquire or apply or, or call us. So, yep. Good, good questions. Anything else before I hand it over to David or David? You're gonna go next? David, David. So my jump drive was not working, okay. but you may wanna try here. Oh, you did, okay. Yes, Paul. Howdy, y'all. Hi. How's it day been? Great. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, I apologize for the hiccups we've had. Um, some glitches with my computer. I think Bryce's computer jet flash drives. And um, I was meeting with some families trying to get them here for the fall and things. So, but hey, we're here. We're ready to rock and roll. So a few things I want to touch base and highlight on as we talk about on-campus enrollment um, that I think will guide us through the conversation here in the next few minutes. Um, one is if you've been around the world of admissions and enrollment, you may have heard people enroll to it as the enrollment funnel. Um, and I'll show you a beautiful graphic here in just a moment that I, that I spent hours downloading off of Google um, and customizing and working really hard on this beautiful graphic. Um, but oftentimes it's referred to as the enrollment funnel. But I heard a gentleman one time call it the enrollment mountain, and I have loved that term and I have stuck with it, and so my team and I refer to it as the end mountain. Um, I didn't take the advanced time to flip the funnel upside down, but you get where I'm going here. So typically in the world of admissions and enrollment, you start with leads or prospects at the top of your admissions, your enrollment funnel. And sometimes people say, well, you just need more names or there's different ways to get about that. And you get them in your funnel and then the admissions team and the entire campus works them through the process of getting them to inquire, getting them to apply, getting them accepted, 
placing their deposit, and all the things that happen in between that. Um, and I heard this one gentleman one time say, hey, it's not getting any easier. This is, we gotta flip this upside down, it's a mountain. So how we talk about it in our team is the enrollment mountain. So our job is, is the admissions team, SWU, is we are dragging students to the base of the SWU mountain, lots of different ways. You all help with that, where our team is doing it in a bunch of different ways, and we'll talk about those different ways about how we get them to the base of the mountain, and then how do we get them, drag them, push them, the whole family, up each step of the process, and then where we're at right now in this enrollment process for fall 19 is trying to keep the top of that mountain as cold as possible so we don't have summer melt. So yes. see this beautiful picture I'm painting? It's yes. gorgeous, great. So right now we're trying to put the freeze on the top of our mountain and to keep these students who are deposited, deposit and make sure we can still keep them here for the fall. So that's kind of the, the process we go through. So right now we're, this, the last couple of years obviously for fall 19 we've been dragging prospects, leads, inquiries, whatever fancy name you want to term, give them, get them to apply, get them accepted, get them to campus visit, all the other steps in the process, file their FAFSA, all these things that need to happen. Um, and at the same time, many of these students are doing this to three, four, five, ten. I heard another student recently that got accepted to 35 colleges recently. And so there's students are, are getting excited about this process, and so there's a lot of schools doing the same thing. So um, back to all what Bryce was talking about, there's a lot of noise, and so we, how do we make it personal and through that process? So, so we talk about Enrollment Mountain. Um, taking a look back over the last few years, um, here's some numbers just to kind of some paint some pictures for you guys as to where we've been. Um, inquiries, and what we label a student as an inquiry is a student that we have enough contact information that we can either email them, call them, mail them something, um, and sometimes we get just a name of a student or we'll just get a, t a phone number or we'll just get something else and we'll put them in our system as a prospect to try to get them to keep moving forward in the, prospect, in the, in the process. So you'll see for fall 19, which is the, um, the bar with the little shaded lines, I guess, um, this year we're just shy of 11,000. Last year was kind of this hoorah year um, and uh, I've landed about for, for freshman students around 15,000. Previous years were in that 7,000 mark, and if you go back for many years, it was in that seven and 6,000 range. This is pretty common, not just at SWU, but a lot of universities the last few years. Um, an inquiry is, is not as relevant as, as an inquiry used to be. Obviously, yes, we want a student's name so we can continue the dialogue with them, but that's not the golden starting point that it used to be. Um, and you'll see the last year was 5,000 more where we had this year. Um, there were some things we were doing with some of the companies we work with. Um, working towards that with the goal of previous years to say we've got to develop and build a bigger inquiry pool. Well, we did that, doubled it in one year, but for the enrolled number of students, it did not, we only got one more student that entire year out of that process. Um, and so we've been continuing to tweak and evaluate what's the best way, what's the right, what's that sweet spot number, um, and obviously we'll take as many names as we can get, but there's a certain point when admissions team and the campus can only do quality follow-up with a certain number of students, and so that's what we're trying to find the sweet spot. Applications for freshmen, um, you'll see that last year uh, was, a, was the one year we've had over 1,000, where we had 15,000 inquiries in the system to, to work through that process to get to, um, but really that eight, upper 800, 900 has been a consistent mark, and that's really where we've landed this year. Um, admitted students, same thing, last year had a little bit of a higher number, um, but you'll see Really, it's right around that 500 mark we, 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 where we have consistently been and where we're pretty much lining up this year. We'll have a couple more freshmen that are still applying, um, and we're working with those students right now even this week to figure things out. Um, so for our freshmen, that's kind of the glance of what's been going on the last few years. Transfers looks somewhat similar, a little bit different. Um, inquiries has been a, a little bit of a different trend the last few years. Um, applications is where we, we have seen where we have had a – a shift in our, in our area, and if we look at the numbers for the other SCIC schools or other NACAP schools, which are other private four-year Christian institutions in the southeast, most schools, um, the four-year institutions, have seen a similar trend with the, with the application numbers, um, and so that, that seems to be a consistent trend here in the southeast. Admitted numbers the last couple of years have been a little bit down as well, and so that correlates pretty well with the application numbers that we've seen. So. That, those are just some quick rear view pictures of where things have been the last couple of years, um, but paints 
paints a portrait for where we're trying to go next. So going back to the concept of trying to get these students to move up the mountain. One thing we do um, is we track what we call the source code for a student, which a source code is what is the first time we ever received or got their name or their information. And so we track as many sources as possible. And some of those would be a name that maybe one of our summer ministry teams met a student at a camp three years ago and that student filled out a card we put on our system. That was the first time we got their name. So we marked their source code as summer ministry team, X number of years so we can track. Um, another one may be, I could pick on somebody, but another thing, um, pre someone signed up out of the blue to come to one of our preview days. Or someone, we worked with a vendor and we bought a student's name, they clicked on an advertisement, they went through the process, they became an inquiry. So we have about 105 different sources that we've tracked. Um, some schools have a thousand, they get so granular. Uh, we have gone back and forth and that seems to be about the right number where if you have too many, you, you, you can't do anything with the data. Um, so we have about 100 that we track. For fall 19, for the freshman students that we're working with, which that numbers are not, still not done, there's still things in flex, we won't get any, a lot more applications and inquiries, but for the students who have deposited so far for fall 19, 39% of them, their very first source code was they either signed up for a preview day or they signed up for a personal visit or maybe another campus visit, but primarily that's a preview day or a personal visit. So almost 40% of our students that we have deposited for this fall, the very first time we got their, na their name, is they sign up for preview day or personal visit on their own from the website or they called or something of that nature. The next biggest one was the application. What that means is the first, so we didn't have these students in our system as an inquiry. The first time they came on our radar is they actually went online and completed the Southern Western University application. So right there, over half of our applications are coming in, really, we call them stealth, stealth students. They kind of come out of nowhere. We didn't have them on our radar before. Um, now, we, people on campus may have been engaging with them. There may have been a conversation, but we never got them in our system to track them. Um, these are, seems to be a growing trend with a lot of other institutions. What I'm sharing is not, you know, just a swoo thing. Um, but some things I want to pull off of that is the sheer number of students, as Bryce was talking about, how search engine optimization and, and our web presence has to, be, has to be fantastic because most of the students are doing their research ahead of time um, to get them to these points. And the other main thing that I, that I love to see about this is the sheer number of volume of our students that they, may, they probably know about SWOO from maybe a friend or a family. Someone else has told them or they've done some research. and the first thing they want to do is they want to sign up and come for a visit. And so what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about and thanking you for those of you who have been involved in that process is the preview days and the personal visits. Um, obviously, we've been doing a great job of getting and converting about 40% of those students to come to move forward in that process. And obviously our goal every year is to how do we keep tweaking that and getting more and more students to the preview days um, and converting the ones who do come. Unfortunately, this past year, if you remember back in the fall, we had some pretty poor weather and we actually had to cancel one preview day due to hurricane and we had two other ones that had terrible weather. So as I track our number of visitors for the past X number of years, this has actually been our worst year for the number of students to come visit campus. And primarily that is our numbers are down in, in preview days. So actually looking back, some of the years we've actually had higher percentages of students. Um, and I'm not sitting here blaming the weather, but I'm just, I'm just saying the campus visit experience is still the, the best thing that SWU has, has presented for students, and we have done a fantastic job as a campus. So I want to thank everyone here and everyone who's not here for the involvement you guys have had at preview days, personal visits, when our team will reach out to you and say, hey, we've got someone coming in and they want to, Mark, they would love to come and talk to you about ministry. Can you figure out a way to make this happen? You guys as a campus have been fantastic, and I want to continue to, to ask you to work with us and families. Um, it's, it's working. And so we're looking at some other campus visit opportunities. Uh, we have tried this past year some transfer visit days, and the numbers were we would love to have more students. The ones we had come, we had some great conversion rates percentages off of. And we're going to look at some other visit campus visit opportunities just to make sure we're not we're not limiting ourselves to just preview days or personal visits. Now we have, do have groups that will come for campus visits. Um, and as I look down 
to this group over here with the number of students that come for Swoo Fest and things like that. Um, and so getting students here to campus goes back to that. That is one of the, the best things we can do. So I'll continue to encourage and ask you guys, as you know and talk to students, beg, plead them, drag them to the mountain to come here for a campus visit. Uh, we do a fantastic job as a campus converting them. And I think the folk, one of the big focuses for our, our team this year is, is to do an even better job of converting those students through that process. So this just gives a list of the various things. There's even more than, than what's actually on here. But these are the key things like I just talked about. Preview day, personal visits are the, the, the biggest numbers, those, those dwarf things. Now, if you pull out the individual number of students that come for group visits, we have about a thousand plus students that came this past year for SUFAST, Quest, all these different things um, that, that we have listed, science for all these different things, um, and they are touch points in that process. And so sometimes it takes getting a student here for science fair or science something or another um, event, maybe uh, a music event, just a sporting event that may encourage them to say, okay, I've got a little glimpse, now I'm ready to come back maybe later on when the appropriate time, bring my family for one of those larger, more actual college campus visit experiences. So um, those are some of the key things that we're going to continue to, to build upon and, and, and strive to say, how can we improve that, make that even better? And are there other visit opportunities that we're missing? Bryce talked about this a little bit, so I'm not going to spend much more time. Search engine op optimization, we've worked with this company, Bright Edge. They have been doing a fantastic job providing um, us um, some of the results that we have seen and all the behind the scenes things, when you talked about a student who says, all right, if they type in the words um, biology, Christian university, the goal is how do we get SWU to move towards the closer page one. Um, and so biggest things it takes is it takes time, resources, and behind the scenes thing, um, and having a little money to throw out it never hurts as well too. Um, but it's, you can't, Google and Analytics, they're so smart that you can't just go in and just make all these changes overnight and they're not, they're not gonna reward you with an overnight change. You have to show consistency and you have to continue to work at this. Um, so Bright Edge has been a fantastic partner in providing us with that information, but they, they can't do it for us. We have to go in and make those changes. So um, Jared Trudell spends a lot of time working with Bright Edge and then going in and making the changes and then we track the results and see, um, see hopefully the growth and success of what we're doing with that. So. Um, that's helping our on-campus students and our online students, um, but really the, the SWOO name and brand in general as well, too. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. I've touched on this just briefly, uh, but it goes back to um, source codes, how we track and how we get students' names. Um, I mentioned and we saw from the results earlier that the campus visit experience and students applying it right now is our number one and number two ways students are showing up and coming up on the radar. Um, and from there, like I said, there's about 95 other source codes that we track, um, and they're all scattered in that bunch. And some years we'll see one or two students come from this source code, and next year there's five or six. And so just when you get ready to say, well, maybe we need to pull some resources, something happens here as well, too. So we're trying to find that balance of uh, finding out which ones are our most are most consistent, which ones uh, can we continue to improve and develop and spend resources in the right direction. So uh, we worked with a few different vendors to help us buy student names, and sometimes those come from students who are signed up to take the SAT, ACT. Um, there's an organization called Christian Connectors that has been consistently a good source for us. They work with students who are looking just at Christian colleges, you could guess by their name. Um, and so working with different vendors to try to find students who are looking for a school like SUE or a school that has the core values of SUE but they may never heard of us. And the goal right now is really just try and spend our time and energy and resources right here in South Carolina and the Southeast. Um, obviously, we would love to grow and get more students outside the state, um, but I, I personally think there's still so many more students here within the state. Um, and partly because of our location up here in the upstate, there are students a couple hours away from us that that, that name SWU doesn't, does not resonate with at all. And we know there's students even here in the area that, that don't do that. And our South Carolina students, if we're talking about freshmen and even the transfer students, have amazing state aid behind them that can help support them here. So we want to make sure we're getting in front of many of those students as possible. Um, we're about ready as a team to start hitting the road for what we call our travel season. And we'll be going to Christian college fairs. Um, the state of South Carolina does uh, an, uh, a college fair circuit called the Educational Opportunity Fairs. And we'll basically be in just about every high school around the state um, 
over the next couple months and we'll generate a lot of names from that as well too. And a lot of the students that we'll meet on the road are students we may already have their name from and we'll specifically target them in their high school um, to try to develop and build new relationships. Some of those will be new names, but a lot of it is follow up upon that and trying to show them, yes, we're coming to your college, but at times we try to make those personal connections and say, yes, we want you to come to SWU, but it's also going to their, their place as well and um, trying to do anything we can to continue and push that relationship further down the line. Bryce talked about this. The, um, another key thing for us, and um, Ed Welch has been tasked to, to continue to work on this, um, and as, as campus as a whole, we have done a much better job, and I think we can continue to do a great job of sharing our outcomes, whether this is an online format, blog format, videos. Um, we have amazing students with amazing stories, and prospective students, yes, they care about the facts and the data, but when they hear a story and they say, oh, I, I'm resonating with what that student shared, um, that, that's when it all pulls together. Um, our presidential ambassadors just arrived this morning, and they're going through their training today and tomorrow, and I spent some time to talk to them about, yes, on your campus tour, the time you have with these students and families, yes, facts and data, we need to know about our campus, but what really is gonna matter, what students are gonna drive away remembering is not what year Founder Hall was built and the meal plan details, what they'll remember is the stories that you tell them of what happened to you personally in that building and the relationships that you've been forming with that faculty member and on the trajectory, the trajectory you are on and your friends are on to go out and make a difference and change the world. And so that's what goes back and I think it makes our campus visit experience a good solid campus visit experience. Um, and once again, I wanna thank you guys for partnering in that. So those are a few things I had. I don't wanna cut Lisa too short, but any questions for me? Try to cover a lot of things in a somewhat short amount of time. All right. Dr. Reverend Corbin. All right, we're going to transition just a bit. If you guys have navigated onto my SWU recently, you'll notice there's been a new role added or a tab at the top for institutional effectiveness. And what I want to go over with you really quickly is just some resources that planning and assessment has um, started to add here for you guys to use. Um, You will have to be signed in, logged into my suite. You can't see what I'm about to show you as a guest. If you go into the main page of institutional effectiveness, um, you'll see a couple of site pages there. I'm mainly gonna look at institutional research with you today. Um, and there is a quick link to make this easy for you guys to find. And we are going to look at the interactive dashboards. Right now, we have two dashboards made available to you um, for enrollment and completions. You see the thumbnail view on the page. You can click the link at the top to open that into a full screen mode. These dashboards are powered, um, powered by Power BI, which is a, a business analytics software. It's Microsoft. Um, it's pretty user friendly. Um, and so what you have here, you have multiple canvases or multiple screens within each dashboard. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and bore you with all these individual numbers. I just want you guys to know that this is here, that you can sign in on your own, review these resources, and then come back to me if you have specific questions. I know that um, some of the deans have reached out to me to meet with you guys on a, you know, like a division level um, to answer specific questions about this data, but I would encourage you in the meantime to go out and explore um, what we already have published because we're looking for feedback. Okay, so if there is, if there is information that you need, um, data that you need on a regular basis, um, 
some of you have reached out to me and said, you know, I have to report this piece of data, you know, very regularly. Can I have access to that? That's the kind of information that we want to have here for you. This isn't meant to replace, you know, specific requests for information for like a grant application or something like that. But here's our aggregate data as an institution. Um, if we go, let me give you, show you some of the features that this has. Right now, this is defaulted to 2018. Um, I will update this by the end of September. Our census as an institution is three weeks after um, the semester starts. So just within a couple weeks beyond that, about five weeks in, then I'll have those files ready to be uploaded to this, and you will see um, fall 2019 data here. But you can use the filters on the left of the pane to navigate or filter down to any student population that you need. Um, there's even, you know, down to degree seeking, non-degree seeking. And when you do that, you'll notice that these graphs are changing. These graphs are also interactive. As you hover over them, you're going to get information. If you were to click on them, they're all synced together across each canvas. So you don't have to go to each canvas and filter down. Okay, so once you get on your main screen and filter, then each canvas is synced to that filter. Um, you can also take these into a, what's called a focus mode. So if you have a specific graph that you're interested in for, you know, your population of student, you can make that a little larger so that you can, you can see that. Okay, so what we provided really on the first canvas is the enrollment trend. Um, obviously, you can read, so it's by level, division, and college. You can filter down into specific majors here on the side if you're curious about your major specifically. And then the um, second canvas right now is um, FTE and then headcount. It is an unduplicated headcount on the totals. Okay, so you can see a unique headcount um, for whatever year and term you have your dashboard filtered to. And then as of right now, I mean, this is, you know, this is a work in progress, and you may see it change based on uh, the feedback that you guys give to me, but you've got it by location. If you hover over these, you can see for 2018, we had 1,266 students who identified South Carolina as their primary residence. Um, you've got your race, ethnicity, uh, religion, and then age and gender as the last table. And we'll continue to add. You know, if you visit, if you visit this, I'm going to say even in a month, you may see additional canvases, additional information um, happening. And this is the same um, format for completions. And then we have a work in progress for a couple other ones, um, including like retention and career outcomes. That'll be there pretty soon. Have any questions specifically? Yes, ma'am. So if you were working on a grant application and one of the available graphs there gives the exact information that you need, mm -hmm. is there an easy way that that graphic or that it could be downloaded. I mean, I could always use snipping tool, but right. like if the I snippet. wanted a student count by race and ethnicity, the labels are kind of cut off. So clearly that isn't going to work for me. Right. So you understand Yep. Idea. For security reasons, the way that it's embedded, the answer right now is no. Um, it, it's a little, it's dependent upon the Power BI license that we have as an institution as to how much functionality we can give the user. Um, so with the current license that we have, no, you can't. Um, but if you, you know, obviously if you ask me for that, if you say, hey, I've, you know, I like this graphic, yeah, I can easily send that to you. Yeah. Right, yes ma'am. Mm -hmm. Anything else? 
All right, so I, like I said, I, I would encourage you guys to navigate around on this, play with this, and give me feedback. Even if you feel like it's you know something small, if I can hear a resonating theme from faculty and staff, then that gives me an idea of what I need to provide for you. Um, I would greatly appreciate it. And I think that wraps up our session. I don't know what's next for you guys I'm coming up. So how many of you think you'll use the dashboards? I would hope all hands would go up. I mean, because can I ask a late question? So of course you can. Um, everything that I've seen from there so far is what a semester closed the dashboard. Yes. Is, is there so, are there plans to give us I don't want to use the word real time live live reports? Is, for for example, in February I'm going to be asked to build a fall schedule. I mean, or put my classes out in the fall, February, mm -hmm. March. I don't remember how many admitted students I had for February the fourth. Okay, is there a way for me to be able to see my enrollment trend in February or March so I'll know whether to put one, two, or three intro classes out there? And then what we talked about the and our Virginia is to know if you need five English classes so or you can't those semesters. I you said I yeah, I no filter. yeah, you can do it by term, but that's not what he's asking. Yeah, no, so okay, so the dash the the source data on the dashboards that are published for you are based on the institution's official census files. Because we have to have a point in time for aggregate fact book type data, you know, to say here's where we are at this this point um, each term. What I believe James is asking is live data for planning purposes. Are you asking for like February to February to February or just historically, yeah. And where I am, because I mean, like I said, I mean if I had if I had 25 students in February last year, 28 the year before, and 22 the year before that, if I have 12, I'm the only need to put out one intro class and I need to figure out my load rather than putting two of them out there and then get whacked or filling up two classes and having to put a third one in at the last minute trying to find an instructor. So, because I mean, if, I, if I'm at 36 in February, I, I don't have a way of remembering my trend. I guess that's what, does that make sense? It makes sense. And unfortunately, I'm going to say the answer is no. Can we give Can we give a live report for where you are at that point in February for um, you know number of pre-registered students for this course? Yes, we could run something like that through, but it wouldn't have the historical where was I February of last year? Where was I? Not for the course. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Either way. Yeah. Course level pre-registered at a course level, um, major level. By student whatever live data yes but at that point in time for a prior year we wouldn't have that unless we had frozen that um, Genzabar doesn't capture and store it like that yeah yeah and so right that's the goal no, this would probably be an everyday. It's a lot of data, huh? And so that's that's a hard thing to implement. And then you have to have, you know, you've got to give time for an actual trend to develop from that. Just like you'll notice that the dashboards start for fall 2016. Um, our campus has put an immense amount of work into data cleanup in the last two and three academic years. Without that, these are useless. Dashboards are useless. And so, you know, we have to have reliable and valid data as the source to even get to something pretty that you can click on and use that easily. And our, our you know, administrative staff, faculty, data governance committee, planning and assessment department has put a lot of effort into getting, you know, just three, four years of historical data clean and reliable so that we can identify some trends 
And so like April's saying, now, now the hope is, how do we get more granular along the way besides just have a census? Yes. Uh, Lisa, intriguing, love the data, lots of fun. Um, one of the things uh, that I noticed as I start to do a little investigating, uh, in religion in particular, we're going to have likely more and more students that are double majoring. Uh, I noticed that uh, with the data, it only evaluates the primary major, not the secondary major. It does. It has a column for second major. It does. Mm -hmm. um, it does. If you, if now it doesn't have a filter for second major, and I could easily add that, that's the kind of feedback I need. It is a column. So if you like were to filter for their first major, you would see what their second major is or by student type, but it's not a filter, which we can add if that's, if that's what's needed for you guys. I hate to get so, so many filters on the side, it gets kind of clunky, but. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Thank you, guys.